people here in this room who have had such an impact in your professional and personal lives. You've had such a shaping contribution to our country's character and to the character of this community. And when I look at the 130 years, 137 years, I should say, history of this congregation in this community, this congregation has impacted the city of Redlands in wonderful, powerful, meaningful ways down through the decades. And when I think of what Jesus says in this text, to those who have give, been given much, much will be expected. I think he's thinking of us. And he's talking to us. Now, many of you think back on your career or your volunteer efforts or the things that you've accomplished, and you might think of Jesus' words in Matthew 25, where he tells the servant, well done, good and faithful servant. Now enter the kingdom of rest. Well, we'll hear that word someday, but his words for us are not the words from Matthew 25, but they're words from Luke 12. To those who have much, much is being expected. Now, you've probably heard these words before, not just in Jesus' words in the Bible, but these are words from Uncle Ben Parker. You know Uncle Ben Parker, right? He's, he's the, the uncle of Peter Parker. I'm not talking about Peter Piper who pecked a peck of pickled peppers, but I'm talking about Peter Parker, the one that got bit by a spider and became Spider-Man. And he had amazing powers. And Uncle, Uncle Ben Parker said to Peter Parker, to those who have received much, much will be expected. You know where the comic strip writers got that from. <laughs> These words from Jesus are words to us, especially those of you who have many abilities. To you who have much, more will be required. So the question that this raises for me at least, is what is Jesus requiring of us? What more does Jesus want from us? Well, when I look at this text, I think there's plenty of things that we have the abilities to do that Jesus is asking us to use our abilities for. Certainly, we who are parents, how many parents do we have here? How many of you are parents? Now, you certainly know that the abilities that you have you've told your kids this, I'm sure, are for them to make a living, right? And they say in, in the literature that adolescence is extending more these years. It used to be at the turn of the century into the 20th century from the 19th century. You know, adolescence would end right, right around 16 to 18. And then in the mid-70s, it was like 21. Now adolescence is continuing to about the age 35. <laughs> Quite honestly, the literature says it's at least to 25. And it's all the factors that go into being an adolescent. But we who are parents want our children to get to a place where they're going to be responsible and they're going to be able to make a living. They're going to be able to use their abilities to work. And of course, this is a biblical idea. Even the children of Israel were taught by Moses as they were leaving the land of Egypt and beginning to be tutored in the desert and preparing for responsible life in the promised land. Moses said this to the people. He said, remember the Lord your God, for it is he who gives you the ability to produce wealth. And Paul said, if you don't Work, you don't eat. It's biblical. You got to get out there and work. Now, many people I know struggle. 
I have two of my children that decided to get art degrees. How does that work for you, Ron, an art degree? You do something else, right? Well, you know, a few people, a few people actually make it in art. But whatever you're doing, you need to use your abilities to take care of yourself. Certainly, that's a big part of what we have our abilities to do. And there's some people who have taken very good care of themselves and have done very well. A guy like Bill Gates, for example. Or a guy like Warren Buffett. These folks have made a lot of money and have been very, very successful. But one of the things about being successful and using our abilities to make money is what happens when we've made enough? Do we just stop using our abilities? No, by no means. You don't just sit back on your laurels and stop doing stuff because God has also given us the ability not only to care for our own needs but also to serve other people. In Ephesians chapter 4 verse 28 it says, use your hands in honest work and then Give generously to others in need. I think it was Howard Hughes that said, uh, in response to someone that asked him, how much money do you need until you're satisfied? And his response was, just a little bit more. That's really the essence of materialism. And then you consider his life, how his life ended, and it ended just turning in on himself, absorbed in, in his own life, not giving or serving, but just turning in. Any of you see the movie, The Aviator? Leo DiCaprio uh, did an amazing job of portraying what Howard Hughes' life kind of ended up as. We don't want to be there. We want to be giving, we want to be loving, we want to be serving. And yet, you ask the typical person, how much more money do you need to be happy in your job? And what is our answer? Just a little bit more. Just a little bit more. And then, I don't know if you ever did this, but maybe when you were younger, you, you said, if I just had X amount, then I'd be happy. Then what happens when you actually get X amount? Well, it's just, you just need a little bit more because our needs and our wants and our desires just adjust to the resources that we have and expand from there. And so one of the things that we're being called by Scripture to do is not just take care of ourselves but also use our resources to care for others. You know, I used to be a little bit down on Bill Gates because back in 1990, he only had three billion. And, and he didn't really give very much of it away. I was looking at his stats, it was two or three percent of his income that he was given away. I mean, most of us here give more of our percentage of our income away than that. And I thought, what a, what a you know, self-centered person. But he said at the time, I'm gonna spend, I'm gonna make my money now, I'm gonna spend the rest of my life giving it away. And you know, he's been good on his word. He actually is doing exactly what he said he was going to do. Why is that? How, what, what, what's motivating him? You know, uh, Dave Olson, um, help, help me on this, Dave, but uh, Dave was the, um, the administrator at the church that the Gates family went to in Seattle. And the minister of the church at the Congregational Church in Seattle um, had a challenge for all the young people, 13-year-olds, you know, in junior high, if they would memorize the Sermon on the Mount, the way I understand it, then the minister would take all those students up to the top of the Space Needle in Seattle and give them a free meal. And Bill Gates was one of those ones that learned the, the Lord's Sermon on the Mount. So you look at the kinds of things he's doing today. He's been informed by the one who said, blessed are the merciful, for they will receive mercy. 
He's been tutored by the one who said, store up not for yourselves treasures on earth where moths and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moth and rust do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasures are, there your heart will be also. And he's spending his life and his resources just joyfully giving things away. And everybody who used to be friends with Bill Gates in the business world said the guy's turned into a nut. He just won't talk about anything else besides giving his money away. It's like he doesn't even care about computers anymore. I think that's a beautiful thing to be stung by the buck and to use those super abilities to bless other people. And there's plenty of people here in this congregation who are doing that, who have done that, and who continue to do that. And you are not only making a difference in this community, you're making a difference in this church, and you are being an inspiration to our young people. I think one of my biggest blessings from the month of May was going to the mayor's prayer breakfast with many of you here. I think we had the largest contingent, see, from the First Congregational Church at the mayor's prayer breakfast this year. Don't you think? It was a large crowd we had. And we had one of our own speaking at the mayor's prayer breakfast. It was Brianna Moore. And Brianna, I was so inspired by you. Want to come up here for a minute? Come on up here. I, I want you to just tell us a little bit about... Uh, what you shared at the, the mayor's prayer breakfast. Um, you told us about a mission trip that you went on. Um, I, I guess you were a little concerned about not being able to take a shower, is that right? Well, the water there um, was really dirty, like if you take it out of the tap. So when we were told to take a shower, we couldn't like, let any get in our mouths or else we would get sick. So we also couldn't brush our teeth with the water, and it was an inconvenience. It's really an inconvenience, right? And uh, did you just uh, spend the whole week moping about your own problems and needs? Until we went out into the community, and we saw that like, they didn't have any water, like mm. any running water at all. You know, one of the things that really struck me, too, is uh, you shared about some children who stopped going to school. And, and what did they wind up having to do when they stopped going to school? They have to find a job to help their parents pay the rent. Sad thing. And it makes you really realize what a, what a difference uh, we have with our opportunities and the blessings we have. Um, Brianna, thank you for the way that you have taken time in your schedule to go and serve people who are less fortunate and the way that you bring back an inspiration for all of us. Let's show our appreciation to Brianna. <laughs> Thank you. You know, Brianna is one of our young people that's been inspired by Scripture. She's been inspired by our teachers at a Christian school. She's been inspired by our youth program. And she's been inspired by the life of her parents and by you. This is a church where Christ's love is meeting our lives. This is a place where we are seeking to be a compassionate living presence of Jesus' love for one another. And you're making a difference. And, and that's a beautiful, beautiful thing. You know, we're given the abilities that we have in order to care for our own needs, but more than that, to serve others. And ultimately, we have given, been given our abilities to honor God and serve the Lord. I love what it says in 1 Corinthians 10. Paul taught, whatever you do, do it all for the honor and the glory of God. We have the very breath of God that has enlivened us. Now use that breath of God that's in you for just bringing honor to God. This is what I think Jesus is telling us in our text that was read for us today. It's an amazing text where you have this description of Jesus as if he's like a groom that's gone off with his bride. And they're off at a honeymoon, and we're the servants left behind. And in the story that Jesus tells us, 
What are we to be doing as we are waiting for the groom to come back with the bride? Well, we're supposed to be sweeping up and cleaning up. We're supposed to keep the lamp lights burning. We're supposed to keep ourselves dressed and ready to greet the groom when he comes through the door. We're supposed to be setting up the table and preparing all the elements around with the utensils and everything else. This is what we do because the groom is coming back. And in the story of this groom coming back, what do we see? The groom comes knocking on the door, just as Jesus comes knocking on, the, on our hearts. And we open the door and we let in the groom. And what happens? Jesus says, sit down. I want to serve you. And Jesus puts on an apron. And he says, thanks for being ready for me. And Jesus says, I love you. And we look around for the bride in the story. Where's the bride? We realize we're the bride. We're the very bride of Christ. And when we use our gifts and when we use our skills, when we use our spiritual abilities and when we implement our personalities and experience and we use it all for God, then what we, what we create is this loving divine marriage between the church and Jesus. And it's a beautiful thing. And then you notice the rest of the story when we don't do that? It's not a beautiful thing. Were you listening to the scripture? Not a beautiful thing. But we want to concentrate on the beautiful thing that is ours when we use our shape for the Lord. And so one of the things as we reflect on our text today, I'd like us to just think about what are our abilities. Just think about your abilities that you can use for the Lord in your life. Romans 12, 3 says, try to have an estimation of your capabilities by the light of the faith that God has given to you. You know, one of the things we're going to do here in the next couple of weeks is we're going to give you a, a shape assessment test. Anybody can hopefully go online or we'll provide some hard copies for people here. And I, we want to encourage you to take, take the little evaluation test and say, okay, what are my abilities that I can use for God in the, in, in, in the ministry of the church or somehow in the community or world around me? How can I use my abilities for God. How many of you have taken personality tests, uh, Myers-Briggs or, or um, uh, PET or what? You know, there's all these various different uh, resources that are available to us. Think through who you are and how God has made you and what God could be doing in you. It might be just continuing to use you how God has always used you. I saw an interview with Warren Buffett and Charlie Rose and also Bill and Melinda Gates were there. And Charlie Rose was asking Warren Buffett about what he's planning on doing with all his resources. He says, you know what? I'm only good for one thing. He says, when I think about my abilities, I'm, the only thing I'm good at is, you know what the answer is, right? What is Warren Buffett good at? Making money. That's what he does, he makes money. He says, I just, I just got to continue to use my gifts and abilities to make money. But I realize I can't take it away. I can't take it with me. So I'm just going to take all my money and give it to Bill Gates, and he can give it away because he likes giving that stuff away. <laughs> and it was, it was really an interesting thing to, to hear him say that because here's a person who realizes he can't stand philanthropy. It's, it's a distraction to him. But so he can just take a chunk of his money and just hand it over here. And he says, Bill's getting it all because he, he gives it away really well and thoughtfully. Now, it might be that when you consider your abilities, you just continue to do what you've always done and you just do it to the honor of God and service of others, taking care of your needs, but also being concerned for others and honoring God. Now, it also could be that you might do something different. I remember um, years ago, my wife and I are both Seattle Seahawks fans. This was before they had ever gone to the Super Bowl. This was when they had the cute colors. Remember the cute colors that they would wear? They don't have cute colors anymore. They look like Darth Vader or somebody on the field. But the Seahawks, 
Um, this was back in the day when Steve Largent was on the team, and he had like the, the, the passing re reception record of football. And the quarterback that threw most of those passes to him was a guy by the name of Jim Zorn. Any of you guys remember Jim Zorn? No? Oh, you do. Oh, well, you're from Seattle. Of course you do. <clears throat> well, they were talking about Jim Zorn maybe not coming back the new year, and it was off season, and Cindy and I, uh, we were students in college at the time, and we went and visited a church kind of like we did because I knew that, that I was sensing a call to ministry, and we, and we thought, well, we're getting close to the end of, our, of the year here, and we didn't have a responsibility on Sunday morning, and we thought we'd go visit a church on Mercer Island in the middle of Lake Washington in the Seattle area. And we went to the Mercer Island Covenant Church, and I heard that any church that wants to have an effective ministry ought to have a really good nursery in order to reach out and, and minister to, to families. And so we decided to go by the nursery and look at how the nursery was. And while we were there at the nursery, there was Jim Zorn sitting on a rocking chair with a baby in his arms, rocking the baby. You know, special ability and gift that he had totally different than what he did in football. But he was using his gift. How are we using our gifts to make an impact in other people's lives? And then, not only are we assessing the gifts that we have, but how are we dedicating those gifts to the Lord? I like what it says in Romans chapter 12, verse 1. It says, offer yourselves as a living sacrifice to God. A living sacrifice to God as his servants, as a pleasing and acceptable offering to God. How is it that we offer ourselves to God? Well, a lot of it has to do with just saying, Holy Spirit, come and use me. It has to do with us as a whole congregation saying together, Holy Spirit, use me. Can you say that with me together? Holy Spirit, use me. Say, Holy Spirit, use us. Holy Spirit, use us. And you know, for 137 years, God's Spirit has been using us. And this church has been shaping this community for Christ, for good, for God, and really forever. And you know that means that we started 137 years ago and didn't change a thing after that, right? Do I hear amen? <laughs> Thank you for being honest. Change is difficult. Change creates anxiety. Anxiety creates conflict. Conflict creates disruption. Disruption makes, dis makes unity um, get all uh, out, of, out of whack. But the only reality is that we have a God who's a God of change who's doing things. And when we take time in retreat and we pray, then God can use us to advance forward in the ways God wants to use us. And you know, if you look at this building, this building does not look like it looked when it was built at the turn of the century, moving into the 20th century. You know, in 1888, that we had the little chapel next door. But at the turn of the century, we built this sanctuary, and it didn't look like this. It had a center pulpit right here in the middle. You see this communion table? It was down on the floor. This is a theological reason that it was on the floor, because we're Reformed Christians, and we don't look at at the communion being something that's given to us from up above, at, from the altar, but communion is, is, a, is a table that is down, that sits down together with the people. And we didn't have a cross on the wall either. Remember, we're, we're descendants of the pilgrims, and the pilgrims were the anti-iconoclastic individuals. They didn't believe in those religious symbols. And you know this, this, this wall right here? This wall actually was a folding partition, and it opened up, and all the children could sit here and look out into the sanctuary. And while they looked out in the sanctuary, you know those kids had the best seat in the house, because who did they look at? 
Jesus, the resurrected Jesus. These were the um, graphic illustrations for the children to be taught what it means to be a Christian. Because you know that kids who are listening to adults, you know from Charlie Brown what they hear when adults are talking, right? Wah, wah, wah. But when they sat there in their children's seats, they saw the risen Lord Jesus Christ and knew that Jesus is here with them. They saw Jesus holding the lambs, who's the good shepherd, and they knew that we are the lambs of God. And he cares for us like a good shepherd. And they saw Jesus knocking on the door of their heart. And then they would take that partition and close it up and the kids would have their, their Sunday school. But you can just see in this sanctuary over the years, things have changed in this, this sanctuary. Programs have changed. New things have happened. God has done new things. What new things is God doing in our lives? The one thing I can guarantee, if we're not open to change, the change of the Holy Spirit, when we open ourselves up to him, you know what will, will happen? We'll just roll up the tent and close shop. You know, today is the very last day for the Barnum and Bailey Circus. It's a circus that couldn't change. And they're rolling up the tent and closing shop. 147 years, they were called by McClure's Magazine Another magazine, I think, has rolled up the tent and closed shop. But they were called in McClure's magazine, a kingdom on wheels. The Barnum and Bailey Circus was studied by the U.S. Army in order to explore how tactical devices can be, can be implemented when you go onto the war field because they were able to take all that one mile of train cars and and dismantle it and set up the circus in just a couple days. The U.S. Army had something to learn from that. And now they've just rolled up the tent and closed shop. Today's the last day. But I know that there are wonderful days ahead for this congregation because Jesus is still knocking at the door of our hearts. Jesus is still using our abilities our spiritual gifts, our heart passions, our personalities and experiences. Jesus continues to work in this congregation. And we have a passion to be a place where, where we are center for sacred worship, where we're, we're teaching and performing sacred music that makes a difference, carrying on the traditions of, of wonderful music. We're also a place that is deeply committed to Christian learning. And we have more PhDs and master's degrees in this church than I think any other church in town. Our statistics show it. We have more doctors, and I include you, Dennis, in the mix. <laughs> Sorry about that, guys. You guys, you, you, Dennis, are my favorite friends because you let me joke uh, last week when, when, when we needed a joke, right? We needed to have a little laughter. Last week was a tough, tough week, and Frank's doing better. He's home, by the way, everyone. God's working compassion in this church among us. How is it that God is working in you, and how is it that God is using your gifts to shape the ministry of this church and to shape its impact in the future of this community? Let's take some time and pray about that, shall we? And uh, let's take some time of quiet and reflect on what God's Spirit is saying to each of us. Let us pray.